Hi, this is Heather Andrews. I'm the Thoughtful Gardener, and I have been uh, joined today by Louise uh, from Edge of the Woods Native Plant Nursery. She's a horticulturist, and uh, we are going to be talking about plant this, not that, for the uh, migration of the monarch butterfly and what native plants you might want to consider in your garden to be able to help fuel not only the monarch migration, but migration that's upcoming. Can you see my screen? Okay, Louise. I see you. I don't, is the PowerPoint up? Okay, thank you. I will get that up right now. And I don't see it on Facebook, but I don't, I'm on the page. It will. Well, I see it now. I see it. We're okay. good. Yeah, right. Yep. It usually is somewhat of a little bit of a delay. Mm-hmm about 30 seconds or so. So it always takes it just a minute. Thanks for being patient on that. Um, so here talking with people about native plants, what's probably the most common question you get, Louise, about why people should consider planting native plants versus more ornamental or exotic plants? Well, that's the most common question is why. Um, and uh, the answer is because they play a role in the ecosystem and we try to encourage people to look beyond the looks of the plant and not worry so much about what color it is or if it bloomed from somebody's birthday but more let's take a deeper look and what kind of life is it um, supporting what what, right. what other creatures can you see in Absolutely. And we're lucky in the state of Pennsylvania to have Doug Tallamy, who's really been sort of the person beating the drum on this issue with several recent publications. Um, and I think that, you know, his, he, he recommends that our goal should be to have the most productive landscape possible. And to do that, we would plant things that would normally be um, native to this ecosystem to provide multiple things other than just the look of the plant. We want to think about habitat. We also want to think about um, insect populations because the insect population is so important to our food supply as well as for our wildlife. So can you talk a little bit about some of the things and what, what, would, what would make a native plant versus an introduced plant? Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Well, a native plant evolved here and it is there is a little bit of science behind how to determine if it if it evolved here or if it was brought in early on by some of the early settlers but the key indicator is is it playing a role in the ecosystem um and by that if they evolved here we, we now know that nothing evolved in isolation everything evolved in community and an interconnected intricate web of interactions between the plants animals, the insects, the soil even, um, and they all depend on each other because, you know, back when the ecosystems were forming, there was no one there to go add a touch of fertilizer or uh, splash some water on it. So um, they depended on other elements of the ecosystem to provide everything they needed. And in turn, they returned something of benefit to, to the pollinator. Like they needed to be pollinated, so what they gave the pollinators some nutrition. So um, they're all connected. So a native plant is one that's documented to have occurred before European settlers arrived. And sometimes they can do it with anecdotal evidence, sometimes with fossils. Um, sometimes it's a little tricky. Sometimes maybe there's a fossil that appeared, you know, a million years ago and then wasn't there for a while, you know. So there's some mysteries, but for the most part, it, it's pretty well document what what is native and what is not. Absolutely and so you know really it's about providing a great ecology for all of the local uh, plants but also the the, the animals that survive are, um, are survive because of those those plants. So there's specific pollinators that have evolved with those plants and only that particular pollinator can uh, actually help that plant survive. And so, for example, there are bees that, a uh, honeybee, which a lot of people, this got a lot of press, right? 
um, that save honeybees, but honeybees actually aren't native either. They're imports from Europe. So the state of Pennsylvania, uh, there are over 400 native bees. And if you were to come to my garden, you would see so many different kinds, you can't possibly count them all. But they're super important because some of the flowers that they come to visit in my garden, the little honeybee isn't large get into the throat of that flower and pollinate that flower. So it's really important to have things specific to your area to be able to help those later, uh, no, local pollinators. But a lot of times people think about pollinators, they just think about bees, but that's actually wrong, right, Louise? There are other things that do pollinate plants. Oh, right, right, right. Um, hummingbirds pollinate, um, ants pollinate, beetles actually do a lot of pollinating, bats pollinate. There's, it, it's not just bees, many, many beneficial wasps pollinate. And I just, when you talked about um, specific bees, I just, I have to say this because I think it's so cute. Um, blueberries need, need to be pollinated by a bumblebee because the bumblebee gets in there and it's so big and it bumbles around and it shakes all the pollen around. And that's, that's the only way they get pollinated, I, if I remember what I read correctly. And sometimes they get stuck and they have to chew away out the other side of the flower because they're so big and bumbly. Oh so my goodness. Some really unique associations. And in fact, in some cases, it's a single plant and a single insect and one would, one would go extinct without the other. So sometimes it's very specialized. Absolutely. And birds too are, are huge pollinators. I can say that I've got several native pollinator plants in my garden that I did not plant, that definitely a bird did that for me. Uh -huh. But that also makes them a little bit of a challenge because there's a mistaken uh, uh, perception that if we plant the uh, non-native species sometimes, that those plants might, in, might not go anywhere. There, there's a, there's a, a mistaken perception that, oh, well, if I plant it, it's not a big deal. See, it's still there in my yard. I would challenge anybody to walk back in my tiny forest because there are a lot of invasive species that have appeared due to those birds who have planted them back there for me. Um, so can we talk a little bit about Doug Palamy? And I am a huge fan. If you haven't read his book, Bringing Nature Home or um, Nature's Best Hope, these should be on your reading list this year if you're interested in pollinator and native plants. But can you talk about some facts and figures from those books that maybe our audience might not be aware of? Right. Um, and the thing that he says that it, it strikes home the most for me is that 95% of our land is under private ownership. So some people feel a little helpless and hopeless, like, well, what can I do? I only have this little, little suburban plot. And he provides very hopeful. He said, just plant one native plant. Just start with one native plant. Um, what, most of our land is under private ownership. If all, all of us private owners try to plant native things a little at a time, we don't have to like stay up at night agonizing that we haven't planted everything native, but you know, just keep chipping away at it. And what it'll do is it'll provide an interconnectedness between um, your yard and the next yard and the next yard over so that no matter where a bird is roaming or little insects are flying, they, they can get it throughout their pathway, whether it's a migratory pathway or a foraging pathway. So that, that's one of the things that struck home for me was that 95% or 85, I see that. Well, I don't know, it's, one of, it's most of it. No, most of the I think you're correct. It's 95% of the um, land east of the Mississippi is privately owned. Mm -hmm. I'm a traveler, obviously this, this, this uh, year, my wings have been clipped literally. Um, but, you know, I love Iceland. That's one of my favorite places to go. But last year, they lost a glacier. I don't really know what I can personally do about the fact that they lost a glacier. Right. But what I can do is I can impact my own backyard. And I think if that's one great thing that's come out of pandemic is gardening has become the number one hobby in the United States. And Duck Talamy is not a purist. I'm not a purist. My grandmother's peonies reside in my yard and they will because they're super important to me. But he says we need to convert 70% of our existing yard to native plants. And you are correct. You don't need 
you know, a, a large amount of land to make a difference. You could have the hell strip between the sidewalk and the, the street that is planted very beautifully with native plants. Um, but certainly if you've got a lawn, he recommends considering your lawn to be more like an area rug instead of wall-to-wall -wall mm -hmm. carpeting and mm -hmm. considering um, replanting about 50% of your lawn with native plants and I'll be converting my entire backyard so I'll be doing the edge of the woods over the next year. So the other thing we like to encourage people as I know all, all of us of our age we have favorite plants from our our grandmothers or our moms but um we and that's great but we can change our children's favorite plants and um my children love now that they think of me when they see Joe Pye weeds so yeah. let's Let's change it a little bit. We'll remember our dearly loved non-native plants, but let's pass down to our kids the love of the native plants. I think that's a great, great goal that we should all have because certainly only 5% of our local plants host 75% of all of the butterflies. So if you want to think about, you know, what you can do, like you said, just changing one plant at a time, if a plant's dying out, or maybe it's overgrown its area, you know, this might be an opportunity to do it. And certainly with this summer, as hot as it's been, native plants certainly require a lot less water and no fertilization pretty much at all. So um, that's another consideration right now since we seem to be in somewhat of a drought. Although you wouldn't know that by looking outside our windows at the moment. <laughs> yeah. Monsooning out there. Monsoon time, yeah. So, I wanted to talk about five considerations that we can think about as, um, you know, as good stewards of the land of how we can help. And so one of the trees that I actually got exposed to last year during your customer appreciation week that I had never had before was the pawpaw tree. Somebody, one of your, uh, one of your uh, patrons brought some pawpaws and they were amazing. And I had no idea that this is the largest native fruit that is actually comes from the United States. Can you talk a little bit about pawpaw trees? The pawpaws are really cool. First of all, they look tropical, but they're not. Um, they evolved before some of our more complex insects evolved. So they're actually pollinated by flies and not bees or wasps. Um, so that's kind of cool. So, uh, but, so one of the implications of that is we, we don't like flies too much and as a whole we've done a great job of getting rid of flies so sometimes they don't get pollinated so they do a lot of times people will hand pollinate their pawpaws or depending on your neighborhood um, and your neighbors you uh, some people go gather roadkill and put it under the pawpaw and then the flies will do the job but it's, it's a beautiful tree and you see those flowers there on the slide are so unusual looking um, yeah. so it is a bottomland uh, plant it does like moisture so if you if you want to replace a Bradford pear but you don't have the moisture you know another good option would be a service berry which has the same white small white blooms as that Bradford pear but pawpaws are really cool if you want the fruit you have to have two and they have to be genetically different because pawpaws can make a grove and it would be possible to dig up a seedling and sever the root that connects it and that's two pawpaw trees, but they're genetically the same, so they won't cross-pollinate. So we grow our pawpaws from seed to make sure they have that genetic difference. So you do need two pawpaws for the fruit, but it's a cool tree and one is pretty too, so. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I wanted to talk a little bit about this. Um, this is not my picture, but ironically, um, in a neighborhood no close to mine, they have an open field where it is designed as a floodplain, and it is full, chock full of Bradford pears. And so there's a misperception, Louise, that if you plant some of these aggressive, exotic plants, that it's not a problem. You know, see, it's right there in my yard, but it actually isn't. And can you talk about how devastating that is for our native uh, plants that exist right now? Right. They travel. And a lot of times the reason you don't see them in your yard is because you're managing your yard and you're mulching and you're weeding and you're mowing and you're edging. But um, the birds take the seeds um, and the Bradford pears, actually, you've probably seen them, those little round blue glass um, berries, and they travel. 
and um, they will take over uh, unmanaged areas, including state parks and state forests. And you know, if you happen to have a little bit of woods in your backyard, they'll they'll do that. And this is a great example of look look how the Bradford pairs they take over roadsides. And the thing with roadsides is um, like the miscanthus grass that is so invasive. You can actually watch it along the highways because that's a wind dispersed seed and it starts with one stand and the trucks whiz by, whiz by, whiz by, and it disperses the seed down further down the roadside. And eventually over a couple of years, you see that highway is just completely the side is with Miss Kansas because of the wind. Um, some people, um, yeah, so this is a great picture. There's other examples like butterfly bush. People will say, well, mine dies back to the ground every winter. Yeah, they do that. Um, but all you have to do is um, go up to Lehigh Gap, uh, the Palmerton, Palmerton Mountain there, and the whole mountainside's covered with um, butterfly bush because the, the seeds just got dispersed and it was a, a natural area and it's a big management problem. Yep, so they, it, yeah, so that's one of the things that we used to say early on is we all need to garden as if we live at the edge of the woods because we do, because birds take these things for miles and yes. it'll get to the woods. Well, and the challenge of these is they are not host plants for anything. And that's why I think a lot of landscapers like them, not unlike the barberry, they're, they're not, um, you know, going to be eaten by right. anything. Mm -hmm which is a problem here in the state of Pennsylvania. Um, in my little tiny forest, I do manage my barberry and uh, during one of my stress releases, I would go out and hack it down along with the multiflora rose. But if you were to walk on my neighbor's property, it's gotten so thick that it's almost like a thicket. You can't walk yeah. back there at all. Yeah. And we know that Pennsylvania is number one for Lyme disease, and this is one of the reasons why, is that the barberry harbors ticks. You care about not getting Lyme disease, this is another reason to consider planting natives because nothing eats the barberry and nothing hosts on the, uh, the Bradford pear. So, you know, we talk, want to talk a little bit about natives. I mean, Hey, right now, um, my I have a monarch way station in my backyard, Louise, and I'm so grateful to you all at Edge of the Woods because last year there was a photo card, so you guys hooked me up with a lot of fantastic fall blooming plants. Um, and I will say the the monarch like magnet right now is uh, definitely 100% um, both the Joe pie weed and um, gay flower. They are just all over the gay flower. It's really yeah. That one liatris is, is crazy, yeah. Oh, it's just magnificent. It's fun to see multiple ones um, as the flowers start to bloom. Uh -huh. But, you know, um, you know, these are some of the ones that you also recommended for like moist areas. So you've got things that do great where maybe people have dry, but these are some really good ones for moist areas. Do you want to talk a little bit about these native plants? These two in particular, yeah, they, it's, um, you know, some people will come and, and say, oh, I have terrible soil, I, nothing's going to grow. And any naturally occurring soil situation is not terrible. It's just there are plants that evolve to thrive in those situations. So these particular little two that are showing will grow in, in, in low-lying, moist areas, which some people think of as a problem. I, I love wet areas. but um, So there's lots of alternatives. And if you're having trouble finding a plant for what you think of as a problem area. For, for the, any naturally occurring problem area, there is a plant that evolved to thrive there. Now that we have some other areas that are unnatural, like highly compacted soil, but for the most part, um, we can help find a plant for it. And the other really cool thing about natives and the nutrition they provide, and there's not a lot of research yet, there's some, the nutrition that they provide at that time of year is exactly the blend of proteins, carbohydrates, sugars that the birds or insects need for whatever they're doing at that time of year. If it's migration time, that's the food that they need. If it's nesting time, that's the food that they need. So sometimes they will, you know, obviously we see they do eat some of the uh, fruit of these non-natives invasive. That's how the fruit gets spread. But um, it's not the right 
may not be the right nutrition for them. And it's just this magical occurrence that when they need to lay their eggs, the berries that are ripening at that time are just right for laying eggs. And this, and on and on through, through all part of their life cycle. So it's, it's, it's just magic. Yeah, and certainly something to consider too when you are thinking about putting in native plants is you really want a symphony of blooms throughout their growing season. So early bloomers and then late bloomers. So um, one of the, the, the things that happens in the spring for me is a lot of weeds, like most people would pull dandelions. I actually welcome them because I know my bees are waking up and they need to eat. Um, and some other things like dead nettle and other what would be considered weeds when I go back, they're covered in bees. So um, I leave them for the bees. And then same in the fall, um, as we start to transition from fall to winter, it's really not to cut these things all the way to the ground right. because they do provide habitat for overwintering insects such as wasps. So you definitely want to leave at least a foot of your uh, plant. But more importantly, like right now, I see a lot of birds coming to like my native sunflowers and they're eating seeds. So you definitely don't want to cut them down um, once they're done blooming because they'll be a food uh, source for your birds. Uh -huh. So these are some of the spring ephemerals that bloom and we were lucky enough to have a very long spring due to the fact that it was kind of cold and wet. So. I will say one of the beautiful things that came out of clearing out all of the invasives starting last fall is the ephemerals took back over and there's actually a, uh, a study from the Forestry Service in Pennsylvania that shows that when you start to clear out these invasives that the natives do start coming back and um, so you've got both the trout lily here which is so dainty and beautiful as Spice bush, which provides uh, a very important host plant for the swallowtail. Mm. But it does look a lot like a real, a real favorite that we see in a lot of yards this time of year. What, what do you think um, would be a good alternative to that? Would you recommend spice bush? Instead of forsythia, yeah. I've, we tell people that all the time. It's, it's a little, it's so subtle and beautiful. It's not quite as flashy and showy as Forsythia, but it um, provides a role in the ecosystem unlike Forsythia. And it's a beautiful plant. There's male and female. They both flower. Um, they both are the host for the spice bush swallowtail because it's the caterpillar that rolls up in the leaf. So it doesn't matter if it's male or female. The female will set berries that birds will eat, but it, it's very difficult to um, get the plant sexed before they leave the nursery. So we just tell people, take a few, see your chances are probably 50, 50. <laughs> and it's the, the swallowtail butterfly will be happy no matter which. Yeah. Right. I will say too, I have deer and it seems to be quite deer resistant. Oh, no, very, they don't browse it at all. Exactly. Yep. Here's some other ones too that might be good for understory plants. Do you want to talk about these? Mm -hmm. So a lot of people like um, want to come in and and ask for ground ground covers, just you know, ground covers. Um, and we try to steer people away from a monoculture of, of a single plant to cover the ground. Um, when you're using a non-native to cover the ground, um, in a lot of instances, especially if we're talking about Japanese Pachycandra or Vinca, they are invasive. And they, I have seen woods where the forest floor is covered with Vinca. It's the most unnatural, sad looking thing. Um, but it's basically the same at ecologically as cement. They're not providing a role. So here's a picture of three plants. And we encourage people to plant a diversity for a couple reasons. It's, it looks neat with the changing patterns. Um, if for some reason your site isn't particularly suited to one, you haven't lost your entire investment because you just put in 100 of that one species. Um, so on the left is, a, uh, I think that's foam flower, Tiarella. Uh, and it's a beautiful spring bloom and the leaves tend, tend to be semi evergreen at times. In the middle, that is either, it's so hard to tell them apart, it's either geranium or anemone. No, that's the anemone. 
And that's, that's an aggressive spreading native. So if you really have a lot of ground to cover and you just want to get it covered, the anemone kind of dentist is good. Then on the right is mitella, which is a very, very dainty thing. It's, you can see comparing it to the foam flower, it, the difference in its presence, but it, it will take the same situation, shade, part shade. Um, and then some, the, if geranium, which I didn't get a picture of, also gets great fall color, bright red, bright orange in the leaves before they uh, wither away. And then there's so many other plants. And we, I try to get people to think about ground cover. Does it need to be only four inches tall? And in fact, the taller the plant you use to cover your ground, the less weeding you have because you won't notice the little tiny short annoying weeds and you'll only have to worry about the things that pop up tall through. So that's part of the fun of a diversity differences and there's many, many options for ground covers. And, and this is cer certainly really important under your trees too. If you bring the, the grass all the way up to the trees, you may have a very beneficial tree like an oak. The challenge is, is that the majority of the butterflies and the moss overwinter in the ground. And if they don't have something, they fall off the tree and then they land on the ground. If they don't have something soft to burrow into, like the soil that these plants would have underneath them, we've really not done them any favors whatsoever. So super important to consider some of these native plants around your trees instead of the grass all the way up or just so it's really nice to have some of these under right. there. Right, letting some of the leaf litter lay because some of them actually overwinter inside that dried up leaf. Absolutely true. So I, I, I advocate for being a lazy gardener in the fall yes. and uh, leaving the leaves piled up under the plants and then creating, if you can, um, a really nice, uh, you know, maybe you can go out and steal your, your neighbor's leaves too creating a area that your leaves can lay and then that becomes some food or maybe that soil that's really compact and is not so nice to dig in you can build your beds up in a no dig gardening situations so that might be a way to get around that hard rocky soil that many of us are dealing with. Mm -hmm. so one of the best plants that we can consider are keystone plants and the blueberry specifically I believe blueberry locally it's a great consideration. Can you talk about that versus like the burning bush? Right. So, um, so the, the most question a lot of people ask is, is, is that the regular blueberry? Is that the blueberry we eat? Yeah, it's the regular blueberry. Um, the ones we get in the grocery store are uh, most likely a selection or, or cultivated variety, not a hybrid, a selection, and that's still native. Uh, but you know they might be bigger or sweeter or all ripen at a certain time than the quote wild one. But if you've ever seen a blueberry in the fall, the fall color is just as bright as the burning bush. Now the one thing that you do need to have for a blueberry is acidic soil. So we we try to help people make sure they know their soil is is correct for the blueberry, but what a perfect example of a plant that has the same ornamental characteristics and also supports pollinators with its flowers in the spring and birds and people, if you can get them fast enough in, in the throughout the season and fall yeah, color. So, and then there's just so many other shrubs also with great fall color. There's, there's no need to plant burning bush for the fall color and okay. yeah. So, so that certainly, you know, brings us to probably the fairest of them all in the kingdom. Uh, Doug Talmy says, if you plant nothing else, plant an oak. And there are over 80 varieties that you can choose from, um, but they are in terms of the best possible thing you could consider for a pollinator and for birds if you're a birder. The mighty oak provides habitat for over 534 species. So if you were a bird, an oak tree is the buffet, right? Yeah, it's great. It, yes. So and you, just, you might not see all of that activity on the oak because some of it's going on up, up high. Um, so don't 
dismiss it because you don't see a lot. And then if you do see things like eating leaves or a spot on the leaf, don't panic. That means it's doing something. So yeah. um, I tell people if, if nothing's eating your garden, then you don't have an organic garden. I mean, if I see leaf damage, um, I don't get too upset because that usually means a caterpillar is in my garden. Thing that I do is I do bird uh, net vegetables and my sunflowers because I have a hungry hippo of a groundhog who likes to take one bite out of everything uh -huh. to taste. So he, yeah. uh, <laughs> we compete. But you know, it also is a, a very, the oak is really important for our wildlife because it produces acorns. And there are a lot of wildlife that eat acorns. And so it's Absolutely. truly fuel for the fall and the winter. Mm -hmm. There's some other trees, if you don't have room for an oak um, or maybe want something a little bit faster growing that you might consider. So you wanna talk about some other tree choices that might be an option? Sure, um, some of the smaller trees are, would be red bud, service berry, yellow wood, um, astraea, which is hop horn bean. And then willow, there is a, Willow is the black willow, which is a multi-stemmed kind of just orderly looking shrub, but it's got great, great value. Weeping willow is not native. So a lot of people think it is because we see so much of it here, but that is not native. There, there is the American plum, which is a nice small tree and it, it does make an edible plum and that's a great one too. Crab apples are really awesome trees. They're small, beautiful flowers in the spring. They have the crab apples and I've seen cedar waxwings come and eat them. You do have to be willing to put up with a little bit of that yellow spot that all crab apples get towards the end of the season, but I always felt it was worth it to trade off for the waxwings. So um, yeah, there's, if you don't have room, there's still some small trees and then we have, if you come to the nursery, we have lists of, of uh, trees by their size to help pick one that would be right for your space. So this is one of the things that I noticed in my yard this spring. Uh, that picture is of a, of a wren that uh, took up uh, housing in my, blue, my bluebird house. Uh, but she and her mate worked their tails off literally feeding a nest of nestlings. And what I didn't recognize until I read Doug's work is that one nest requires 400 caterpillars a day. Yeah. Imagine that tiny little bird going and finding 400 caterpillars. She's got to be in a space where it's easy for her to find them. They have a two mile radius. Otherwise, they themselves will run out of fuel running back and forth. Yeah. Yeah. So it's really important that you consider planting native plants because they are host to so many native caterpillars. And where does the pretty, uh, plumage of the birds come from. The, um, so not only from the berries that they're eating this time of year, but those worms provide that. So it's really important to, um, to consider uh, planting things that will support your nestlings. So, you know, if you see caterpillars eating your plants and you're not happy about it, I've had a ton of cabbage moss this year I just go out and pluck them and put them on a plate and take them upstairs and I feed them to the birds. So you might consider um, if they're causing you a problem, you can always provide nature's hot dogs to the birds. So, um, <laughs> they will appreciate it. I can Absolutely. Promise. Yeah. 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 So obviously we've had the hottest July on record in the state of Pennsylvania. And, you know, can you talk a little bit about once these plants are established, what kind of care are they going to need? Well, that's why when somebody comes to the nursery to pick out plants, we, we always have to back up and say, what kind of soil do you have? What kind of sunlight? Because if you match the right plant to the right place, once they're established, they should not need water except during extreme situations. Um, so... There are plants for hot and dry spots. There are drought tolerant plants. Um, probably everything in this, well, no, the picture on the right, those are definitely hot, dry plants. On the left, that looks like a wet area. I see cardinal flower, joe pie weed, and some other things. Um, but 
you do need to water before they're established. So we don't want people to think, oh, natives are no maintenance, no care, put it in and walk away. You do need to water them till their roots are big enough to sustain themselves. Um, and then you should, if, we, if, if you've matched the right plant to the right place, it really shouldn't need a lot of extra water because these plants evolved before, you know, hoses were invented. So, um, but there are always those extreme events and, and that's the open-ended question. What is, what about climate change and the hotter and hotter and hotter summers? And that's just an answer that we're gonna have to watch unfold. But I, this past week, I saw some things drooping in my garden that wouldn't normally droop. And I just let them droop and, you know, they, they perk back up now with all the rain. Sure. So unless you see it turning brown and dying, I wouldn't worry too much about some drooping. And also it's important to know that overwatering looks the same as underwatering. The leaves droop and wilt. So good point. Little. Yeah. And certainly, you know, mulch, you know, I, I, I tell people if it's, if it's looking like it's drooping, you can always add some additional mulch. And this is where saving those leaves over the fall is a great thing. You can mulch them with the leaves uh -huh. and uh, usually they'll perk right back up. They'll look pretty good. Mm -hmm. So there are some super important plants to consider right now for the fall migration. Uh, can you talk a little bit about, from your perspective, probably some of the best ones to consider and that you might have available for them to to, con to think about? Because these are long bloomers, right? right. Asters and goldenrods are, are, are a must-have in any garden. Whenever I help someone put, put together a whole garden and I get excited about, oh, you'll love this, oh, you'll love this, and then I always stop and look at the list and it doesn't have at least one aster and one goldenrod, I have to take out something. Um, so they, and asters and goldenrods, aster is a genus and the goldenrod is a genus also. Within those, there's dozens and dozens of species. Right. So we're not, I'm not just talking two plants, I'm talking 50, maybe more plants. And there's asters for sun, asters for shade, tall ones, short ones, goldenrods for sun, for shade, tall, short. Um, so every garden needs them. And it, it does get important for the migration, especially of the butterflies, because they have a long haul. Did the monarchs go to Mexico? I'm not sure did the swallowtails migrate, but I'm mostly thinking of monarchs. Um, they gotta fly a long way. And in the fall, people start doing their quote, garden cleanup. And that garden cleanup means the smorgasbord is over and they have nothing, nothing to eat. So these asters and goldenrods can really keep them going and leave them going in your garden as long as they can. They'll go past frost, they're pretty, and they're useful. I completely agree. I have both in my garden. You certainly want to also see that you tend to get a little top heavy, so trim them on Memorial Day and trim them again on 4th of July. And I sprinkled my trimmings and I had read that they might re-sprout and guess what? They did. So um, I've got new goldenrods and new asters coming up because I did spread those out. So it might be something that you think about um, as you are um, building your garden up that you can certainly use some of your current plants to maybe make new ones. So that's exciting too. Mm -hmm. But not only are the monarchs hungry, your birds are hungry too. And as we get migrants, they can lose 50% of their body weight every day. So they are super hungry and these plants will help sustain them as well because there's lots of nice uh, seeds that these plants produce. And there's a mistaken perception that goldenrod is what causes people to sneeze, but that's actually incorrect. Do you know the name of the plant that uh, people assume that is causing their fall allergy? Yeah, it's ragweed, right? <laughs> so the, the, the goldenrod is not ragweed and no. to sneeze. You would have to literally stuff it up your nose to be yeah. And you can prove that to any one of your friends that wants to argue with you by look, watching a bee go on a goldenrod and watch all the sticky pollen collecting on the bee's legs. It's a sticky pollen. It does not float around in the air whatsoever. So, Correct. yeah. Correct. So these were just some that were taken in my yard. Most of these came from, but, um, you know, so much fun to walk around and photograph uh, who is visiting every day. It's different. Um, but you see here on the left, that's the gay flower I was talking about. Um, and the bottom right, you see a hummingbird moth uh, visiting um, some, uh, it's a cultivar of our native, but it's, uh, but they seem to like it. And I've got some moths that really like um, that plant as well. 
Um, as well as uh, the Joe Pye weed. Uh, all of my Joe Pye weeds are just now starting to bloom. And then um, I'm going to lobby that perhaps we should think about uh, renaming some of these plants. But the tall one, or the one in the top is Ori. What is the second word of that one? Vervain. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So, uh, so some of these have like a lot of weeds, like weed. I'm going to yeah. lobby. We need to, we need to, admire, you know, make it monarch, you know, masterpiece. And then, yeah. right? <laughs> See, in this case, the botanic name is actually prettier. It's a verbena, verbena hastata, and everybody loves verbena, right? But absolutely, if they don't have weed in the name, they have wart in the name, you know? Right. <laughs> Hoary skull cap. That's what that one's called. It sounds like something a pirate would have in their yard. <laughs> So we certainly will be happy to put these um, resources in the chat, so the, um, copy and paste them, and we're going to follow this up with um, some free guides for you. So uh, Louise has a really nice oak trees and the different ones that are native to our area, and I have one for you on um, fueling the uh, pollinators with five, five weeks to a fall pollinator garden. Um, but I certainly want to uh, take an opportunity questions that are here. So um, I'm going to stop sharing here and I'll post that in the um, in the chat. But we've got quite a few questions here, Louise. So uh, Lisa's asking, is there any way to support native species with native plants using containers? The answer is yes. yes um, I just saw this at Mount Cuba. I will try to pull a picture up and show you while we're but they have done a brilliant job of putting natives in containers to show people that you don't need a big space. So even if you've got a patio and that's all you've got, you can absolutely put natives in containers and then they can go in the yard afterward if you have room. Um, Christina has a question about native plants, but the soil is clay and they had planned to do some lasagna preparation for them. Is that a good idea? Yes, it's a great idea. Um, I love the lasagna um, gardening concept. And what he's talking about is you make layers of good stuff. Um, and so I think that um, you know, if you're not familiar with lasagna, lasagna gardening, Charles Dowd, who is um, from England, started this no dig method. Um, you can watch YouTube videos. He is fantastic. He's so charming but he has not dug in his soil for his native, uh, uh, he sells uh, native vegetables in England and he's, he, he, holds, he believes in building the soil up, not digging down so that you don't create weeds. Um, so absolutely 100%, that's a great idea. Uh, yeah, and I see uh, the, uh, who was it that Christina asked that question, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yes. And um, also, and then you clarified and said the soil is compacted because if the soil is clay, I would also say you could just plant species that love clay and there are quite a few, but True. if it's compacted, it's good to do some preparation. Um, yeah, like the lasagna thing. Mm -hmm. yep. yep. And probably yep. a little bit of both, probably because you're not going to change the soil all, you know, all the way down. So probably do a little bit of, of both, still try to go with clay tolerant species. Mm -hmm. uh, Absolutely. Um, so one question is, do deer and rabbits eat asters? Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, they're tasty too. And we're going to apologize in advance, guys, if we're breaking up a little bit. We are having uh, the remnants of a hurricane here. So we have recorded this and we'll repost it. So if you missed part of it or um, some people are saying they're losing inter internet co connection because of the storm. Not a problem. We're going to repost this. Mm -hmm. um, what's the best way to test your soil? That's a great question. So your county extension service has free to soil test kits, typically. You can also order them online at Amazon if you are having trouble locating your local um, uh, ag. But that should be able to uh, give, get this old test, and we recommend that. Um, that's something you could definitely do. Is there other sources you have, Louise? We, we have the soil test kit at the nursery for people. And um, it can be a little intimidating because it's like got all these pages to it. And we usually open it up and 
show you that it's not as intimidating as it seems. We'll help you with filling out that it's not as complicated as it looks. So yeah, we have them available at the nursery. And then I see somebody did ask when the Penn State soil test is suggesting amendments and um, when, when and how do I add them? And that really just depends on what those amendments are. Because in some cases, see what you've done with that Penn State kit, in advance you've checked off what you want to grow. And um, if that's the case, they usually in their recommendations tell you exactly when and how. And you can also call the extension agent because your test has a code number and you can call your county extension office and ask them questions. They can look up your test results. But the other thing is if you gave them a general, just because you're doing general gardening, they're gonna give you recommendations for general gardening. And in some cases, you don't need all that amendment if you're selecting appropriate species for that type of soil. And it, a lot's gonna depend on what exactly it was that needs amendment. But there's plants that tolerate alkaline soil. There's, you know, so the best thing is to um, follow up with extension on what their exact recommendations were. Yep. Um, can you make a recommendation for uh, daylily replacement? Uh, yeah. There's, if that's just full sun, there's so, so many. Tradescantia or spiderwort would be great. Um, any, I mean, if you like the yellow, there's so many yellow sun natives. Uh, Hellenium, um, false sunflower. So I, I would, if you have a row of daylilies, I would replace it with a whole mixed border of different colored plants that love the full sun. And then you'll have... Um, you know, lots of interest throughout the season. And actually the day, that common day lily that grows on the roadside is actually, in, in, it is invasive. So you wanna not plant it or help it spread. Uh, agreed. Um, I, I would advocate if you could please put in uh, milkweed. It's yep, yep. the monarchs. Um, it can take full sun. It doesn't take a lot of, um, you know, a lot of care. So maybe you could consider putting in some milkweed. I also advocate for creating what's called a pollinator hedgerow. So those are um, full of plants that are provide not only host plants like the uh, milkweed for monarchs, but provide fuel for the migrants. So um, native sunflowers are a good choice, asters, goldenrod, some of the other plants that we've been talking about here, cone flowers, the native ones, not the cultivars. I have a cultivar in my yard and no one visits it. No one. It's pretty, but nobody likes it. So um, I'm gonna also advocate for gay flower this year because oh, yeah. it's been amazing to see so many butterflies. And then also the bee balm. The bee balm is a, a very popular in the garden right now. Um, so, um, and people are asking about what was the goldenrod posted. There are over a hundred goldenrods. <laughs> I don't know that we'll be able to identify that one right now, but if we think about what it was, we'll-, we'll It was, I took, that was the picture with the uh, aromatic aster in the middle, yes. and that was at Longwood Garden, so just- Okay. Didn't go to yep. Longwood Garden, didn't look at the label. <laughs> and they're actually pretty good. If you ask them- It'll be labeled, yeah. They're growing, they're, they're usually pretty responsive, and if you don't know about Longwood, uh, I will say it's my absolute favorite of our gardens here in the state of Pennsylvania. Um, they do grow a lot of exotics. Um, my friend Carl Gersons is responsible for the uh, conservatory, but outside they do grow a lot of natives. And so, especially in Penn's Woods, so it's so inspirational to go over there and see what's possible. Same, right. thing, just a little further afield in is Mount Cuba Center. And for whoever was asking about can we grow natives in pots, that's where I recently saw them, but so inspirational. Um, milkweed, is there any that's shade tolerant, Louise? Yeah, the Pope milkweed, and I can't remember the botanic name right now, and it is a little bit harder to find, and I know we have some at the nursery. We were all excited when we, we grew up from seed and we got a small crop growing. I, I think it's Asclepius exultata, but I'm not, I'm not positive, but it is, I know the common name is Pope milkweed, and that will grow in this shade, but the thing is, butterflies, um, the reason there's not so many milkweeds for shade is because butterflies generally stay into the warmth. So yes. they're not going to go so much into the shady areas. Right. Yep. And we're getting a lot of questions about, is it still okay to plant goldenrods and asters for the fall? I want to assure you that it absolutely is. 
Um, we are going to be moving into cooler temperatures here in the next few weeks, so it'll be a lot less maintenance on you as well. Um, but uh, all of mine that I planted were planted this time last year, so they did just fine. And I highly recommend um, doing that. And a lot of people think of fall planting, but I encourage people to start their fall planting really mid to late August, as soon as the nights get cool. That's all you need is cooler nights. Just so, you know, and the reason for fall planting is plants don't suffer through heat when they, you know, so as long as it's cool at cool at night, you're, you're good to go. And if you've got the energy now and the time, plant, plant now and just, well, when the rain stops, you can water. <laughs> yeah, right now you need, need, uh, <laughs> Serious rain gear to get out there and do it. Your soil, soil might be a little soggy. Yeah. Um, great advice, and in, in, uh, that's true of trees too, right? They do a lot better um, getting root development during these cool, cooler mm -hmm. months, right? Right. And the the really the only prohibition against planting in the summer is, you know, a lot of people would go on vacation so they couldn't water, or it was just hot and nobody wants to water, but. Um, if you can, if you're going to be home and you can water, get it now. It'll still put on some root growth and it'll just be that much further along as it goes into the fall. Yep. Well, we are so appreciative that you all joined us today. If you found this helpful, we would love for you to share with your friends. And uh, this is your week for customer appreciation, right? Can you tell people what's going on there? Yeah, we... Um, we were a little sad that we couldn't do our usual in-person festivities, but we came up with some online stuff and this um, webinar with Heather just fell right into place for our customer appreciation week. But we have a photo contest going. The photos have been submitted. You can go to the website and they are just beautiful and you can click like on them and you know, there's some prizes for the people that get the most votes. Um, we have a quiz. Um, but, uh, Sunday was a couple questions. Tomorrow will be a couple questions, and Saturday will be a couple questions. It's a native plant quiz that I kind of learned how to do, and um, it's fun. There's pictures. You'll get a score. You'll all get 100%. I know. Um, and then the people with the most correct answers, we're going to put in a drawing and pull a prize for a gift card. And then if you do come shop in person at the nursery this week we'll give you a little coupon for some extra stamps on your uh, loyalty card. We have these loyalty cards where you get a stamp for every $25 you spend. And when the card is full, you get some free plants. And so we, we're gonna give you a card that's good for some extra, extra stamps just for being you if you come shop <laughs> this week. So I think, that, right. I think that's most of it. So yeah, we must be everybody, it's so, Oh, I mean, I see some of your guys' names on the participants. I'm like, oh, I remember you. <laughs> but <laughs> Loyal fans, that's for sure. So thank you all for participating. And Absolutely. We got a question in the chat so that everybody knows. Uh, we will um, have the recordings available on our respective Facebook pages, uh, The Thoughtful Gardener, as well as Edge of the Woods. Um, I will also be posting it on YouTube, um, and my YouTube channel is Garden Thoughtfully. There are other uh, YouTube uh, videos there from other uh, interviews I've done about different things like gardening and the mental benefits of it. So if you're interested in following, we would love to have you. And um, we will be following up for all of the participants here, uh, two guides, one for five uh, weeks to a fall garden, and uh, Louise has got also a bonus for you on the different types of oaks that you can consider for your yard. So thank you so much for this opportunity. I really appreciate you. Thank you, everybody. Have a thank great you. afternoon, everybody. Take care. Thank you, Heather.